meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Okay. All right, guys, just it. Folks, if you're waiting to hear from me, I'm just waiting for a, a window on Zoom to open up. So just hang tight and I will be answering questions with my friend, Robert. Live on YouTube. Okay, we're there. Hey guys, um, if you're waiting to hear from me, I'm just waiting for a, a window on Zoom to open up. Hold so on, just hang tight. I have to yeah. turn my volume. E. Okay, can someone say they can hear me and see me? And and Bob, can you give a visual and auditory cue? Yep, yeah. glad to be here tonight with everybody. Okay. Now, Bob, if you can, don't mute on Zoom because I need to hear you on Zoom. You could. I'm I'm staying live. Had to be here tonight with everybody. Okay. Um, here's the rules, guys. Um, we're going to ask, we're going to answer questions. I have to, we're going to answer questions. So please do your best to ask us questions about the content of the video and end the question with a question mark, because we have a screen that has a lot of names and a lot of comments going very quickly. And I am attention challenged, and that will help me especially. Um, so I want to say off um, up front that I have about 10 minutes, but then I'm going to leave you guys in really good hands with Bob. So the first question is, uh, what do you, or I'm going to, if you say you, I'm going to say we, <laughs> what do we think of EMDR therapy? Uh, Bob, do you want to, um, do you want to take that? My experience with EMDR therapy has been uh, really uh, good. I refer people out for EMDR, and it, I find it, it works uh, well for very specific um, issues that someone has. Of course, they can work with uh, trauma. They can help you with trauma. But what I find if someone has a specific phobia or someone cannot get past a specific trauma event in their mm -hmm. life, EMDR I find it, it works really well. Um, I have a, uh, a, a mixed reaction or uh, answer to that question. I think EMDR is powerfully effective for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD-like trauma. Um, but one of the, the, one of the situations that I see often is people getting licensed or certified in EMDR, and that is the primary technique that they use to solve trauma. And it does work, but it requires a good therapist with, who is trauma-informed that has other tools, other uh, abilities. So EMDR by itself does not nearly work as well as a trauma-informed therapist with that. In addition, my healing the inner trauma child method is very different from EMDR. And it, EMDR does not work on attachment trauma, which is the cause of self-love deficit disorder because attachment trauma is not specific PTSD. It, it's, not, it's not one incident. It's not a chronic, uh, chronic episode. It is the whole um, swath of experience from childhood often to late adolescence. And that type of trauma is stored differently um, in our mind, in our brain, in our limbic system. So yes, um, it sounds like Bob and I recommend EMDR, but 
do some research on it before you guys uh, check it out. Next question is by Mima Dragon. How long do trauma bonds last after leaving a narcissistic relationship? I'll start on this one. Um, well, if you guys have been following you know, my work, I often say that most decisions, even the smart ones to leave or to prevent or limit the harm that a narcissist does are often not good enough because the problem is the SLD or the codependent's attraction or unconscious compulsion to keep going back for more. So to the question, how long do trauma bonds last after leaving a narcissistic relationship? Leaving the relationship does not solve the tra trauma bonds. It's getting in there and doing the work like Bob and I um, talk about in order to address the actual trauma bonding source, which comes from your childhood, your attachment trauma, so that when you do leave the relationship, you are not um, white knuckling it or just by uh, uh, just share willpower staying out of it. Bob, your thoughts? Right. When you leave the relationship, that's, that's the biggest hurdle that you've, you've done. It's taken a lot of courage and a lot of vulnerability to leave that uh, very toxic relationship. Um, but that, that's when your healing really begins as far as that's when you really need to do the work on your own wounding and explore what that relationship has meant to you, um, why you might have gone into it in the first place. So you can really understand the roots of the trauma bonding. So it, it's, you know, there, I believe for most people, they have shadows of that trauma bonded relationship that sort of hang on for a while as they're going through the healing process. But if you stay with it, you're going to move beyond it. So Kevin says, I'm sorry, don't you think that trauma healing isn't slightly over promising under delivering title? Um, no, Kevin, you obviously, and I don't say this with any disrespect, um, you aren't familiar with uh, my work or Bob's, and, um, and I'll speak for both of us, and of course, Bob will <laughs> agree or disagree, is if you are a trauma-informed therapist and understand trauma, its origins, and have the ability through um, your psychotherapy approach to solve that and to bring people forward towards healing, then it's not overpromising. My self-love my self-love recovery treatment program, or otherwise known as codependency cure, does that. And it does not do it easily or quickly. So there's no there's no promises that you know sign up now and we'll solve your trauma. Just just uh, give us a check. No, this is hard work. It takes dedication. And for many, there's no easy way. Bob? And, and I would say that uh, if you're working through your trauma, uh, try different modalities to help yourself get through that. So work with a therapist, see how far you can get with that therapist. Um, maybe you need to, to change, find a therapist who does another, has another modality. So there is not just one way, one, one quick step way to, to deal with trauma. It's very complex. It's very personal to you. And um, what I find is that sometimes I have to use a lot of different modalities to help someone kind of unpack their trauma so that it makes sense to them. So they can figure out how they can approach it and how they can begin to heal it. Okay. Um there is a question here. Um, could you speak about forgiving ourselves for not seeing red flags in the past? Uh, 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 Rivertree, check out um, my material on YouTube um, or my book because I explain that the primary cause of self-love deficit disorder, codependency, is, of course, the trauma, but from the trauma is core shame. And that core shame is, um, is self-reinforcing uh, through this self-fulfilling prophecy that we believe that we're not lovable, so we unconsciously sabotage, sabotage ourselves to prove it. So the reason I bring that up is you ask about forgiving yourself for not seeing red flags in the past. I'm assuming that you 
struggle with core shame. And it doesn't help if we keep beating up ourselves. We keep adding more and more what we believe is evidence to the mistakes we made. There has to be a time where we have empathy for ourselves and understand that although we, we, we need to take responsibility, but we're also victims. And so I, I say to you, give, cut yourself a little slack and forgive yourself, but don't, don't go too far deeply into the shame and identify with that versus start to see yourself as someone who can overcome that and be more self-accepting and self-loving. And what I would say to that is if you are recognizing the red flags that you overlooked early on, that's a huge indication that you've done a lot of healing work and that you're, you're on the other side of it. So you're looking back and, you know, our 2020 vision, uh, it, looking back in hindsight is a cruel mirror, <laughs> meaning that we're looking back into our past and, and I've been there where I look at why did I make that choice? Why did I, why was I with that person? And it's understanding that we did the best we could with everything we had at the time. And a wounded heart generally just seeks out another wounded heart. And so that's where you were at the time, but that's it doesn't sound like that's where you are today. So congratulate yourself for doing some really significant healing work that you have that perspective now. Um, Kevin asks, how do you deal with the old nostalgic thoughts about your ex-abuser? Um, Kevin, um, in my theoretical uh, work, I explain that SLDD is an addiction that is based upon an experience of pathological loneliness, which is um, caused by the core shame. And the reason I say that is when you stop something that is addictive, whether it's drugs or a behavioral addiction, like such as spending, sex addiction, or SLDD, it is natural for uh, one to crave to have nostalgic memories of something that was so harmful, so dangerous. And if you, if you were in addiction therapy, your counselor would say, well, that is the trick the brain plays on you in order to get the drug that it needs. So I recommend that you, rec that you look at that nostalgia as, as a vestige um, or a symptom of an addiction and the brain's part of your mind's way of trying to trick you into reconnecting. Because if I look at the 15 or 20 years I smoked cigarettes, um, there is no nostalgia to it. But when I was quitting and a year or two afterwards, I had plenty of nostalgia. And that was just part of that delusional addictive thinking. Bob? And, and I would say that um, part of the trauma bonding with an abusive or narcissistic relationship afterwards, you have those shadows of looking back. And there's a part of us, uh, the codependent part of us that maybe isn't healed yet, that we're we're longing for the best of that person. And we're, we're thinking of all the good times that we had with that person and, and we want that closeness back. And so I would encourage you to maybe do some writing um, as far as exploring parts of yourself that uh, saying, okay, why, why am I longing for this, uh, this person again? Because this is how, how they treated me, what, what's going on internally. So it's a very natural process that's happening within you. So be gentle with yourself as you go through that, that unfolding. Joe asks, just coming out of a narcissistic abusive relationship, is it normal to have cognitive issues? Joe, if you, um, so let's just assume your narcissistically, your narcissistically abusive relationship was on the level of severe trauma. If you said you just came back from the island of Tonga, where there was uh, this huge earthquake. I mean, this is actually happening and incredible tidal waves. And you came back to America and you just couldn't sleep. You were anxious. That is post-traumatic. That is the beginning signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. So Jill, you probably experienced multiple episodes of trauma and your brain probably not only accommodated to it, 
in a, in a very sad and almost ironic way, got used to it. And th- if you um, buy the idea of that this is an addiction, you're going to have this mixed bag of nostalgia, relief, happiness, loneliness, and anxiety. You just left a, a relationship, I'm going to assume, of nightmare proportions. Please understand this as severe trauma. And if you cannot put, wrap your arms around it, look at it like trauma as if you witnessed you were robbed or you almost were murdered. And if you can see it that way, you will understand why you're having cognitive issues and, and I'm assuming anxiety, depression, and everything else. So be gentle, find someone to talk to, process the trauma before it gets put away, and you're going to find yourself experiencing more peace of mind, relaxation, and ability to be present. Bob? Yeah, it's like walking away from a car wreck. So you've walked away from this very traumatic experience. You've gotten out of it, but now you don't know this new world that you're entering into. So it's a very confusing time for a lot of people. In fact, I've uh, many people I've worked with, they'll say, you know, it might just be easier to get back into that relationship. And so what they're saying is they know how to do that. They don't know how to be in this new world. And so it's very confusing mentally because you're, you're literally uh, having to come up with a new roadmap for your life and also a, a new identity for yourself. Who am I now? So it, it takes a while, like what Ross said, just be very gentle with yourself as you go through it and stay strong each day. I really encourage people to read uh, daily affirmations that really help them stay on that path, that grounded path as they're moving forward. Um, guys, I'm going to answer one question, and then uh, I have a trip I need to go to, and sadly, I didn't get enough time to pack, and I need to help my wife. So I'm going to leave this to Bob. Well, um, the, the, the issue, though, Ross, is that I cannot see their questions. Okay. So um, <laughs> this, um, this might be the... Okay, so, okay, so, no, no, we can do this. Um, why don't you... Um, open up your messenger or um, text messages or email and and Derek will send those to you. Okay. 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 Um, Guys, we're going to make this work because we want to. (laughs) Okay. So, um, uh, and and Derek uh, will contact you because I know he's listening. How to overcome a psychiatrist who intentionally gaslit um, a Fanta beatdowns with fabricated diagnoses. Um, Helene, pathological narcissists are everywhere and they feed off the vulnerable, the SLDs, the codependents, because of the human magnet syndrome, unconscious dynamics. Right. So that being said, there's not a coincidence that you're struggling with a psychiatrist who is, who is gaslighting you because they found a person who struggles with detaching from such abuse. The most important thing to do is find a way to end it. And during the most important thing to do is find a professional a psychotherapist to support you while you are ending it because the strength that the the pathological narcissist has the gaslighting psychiatrist, as you say, um, is tremendous, not as much as what they do, but the influence they have over you. So for you to set the boundaries and break free, it's crucial that you have a supportive professional in, on your side who can keep you from identifying with the gaslit narratives which for all I know is, is quite extensive. It is very, very difficult to break free from a gaslighter because of the complexity of how they manipulated you, your mind. So get some support. And with that support, set boundaries and, and go to my YouTube channel. And there are so much um, material there on my observe, don't absorb technique, my induced conversation technique, 
um, many, many examples of how to break free from pathological narcissists. I also have a six-hour video um, entitled The Codependency Cure. So, and that is available at selfloverecovery.com. So, guys, I'm going to let you have a great time with Bob, who will answer your questions and more. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this community. And I only hope that our efforts to make life better and give you hope has added just a little bit to your day. Okay. Thank you, Ross. So uh, just send the questions, uh, type the questions in. I'll be watching uh, YouTube, the YouTube feed. So I think what many of you probably saw tonight was um, how close Ross and I are as far as our techniques and our approaches. Uh, but we, we come about it through different ways, but we say things, uh, our focus is, is really similar. So the question is, how do you move on from a narcissistic family system? I think that's really a, a very important one uh, that's very confusing for a lot of people. The bottom line is boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. So the bottom line is you understanding where you end and where everybody else begins. Because in that sort of family system, it's highly dysfunctional and you're not gonna uh, sort of win. Uh, so it's not about kind of uh, convincing them you're right or, or trying to always uh, be um, where you're, you know, trying to be heard or seen. They're not interested in hearing or seeing you. So that's why it's about doing your work where you're very clear about who you are and who you're not. The narcissistic family system will not like that very much and will keep on trying to engage you because that's all that they know. So it's a very difficult process. So a question is, um, what's the best way to feel about my sociopathic ex after it's all over? Uh, that certainly is a, a journey where you're going through a process of healing that very traumatic experience. Um, I believe that if someone can get to a place of compassion for their ex, especially in that kind of very toxic in, uh, situation, that would be incredible. But my concern would be that that would be a really high bar you might be setting for yourself. So I would just take it a day at a time and see where that takes you. It's about you healing you and less about uh, your relationship with the, the ex. So that's what I would focus on, you, you helping yourself first. So a question is, what do you recommend as far as redirecting boundaries for a daughter who is a golden child that's now on rocky ground with her narcissistic mother? Um, well, that, that certainly is, is a path that, that the daughter, the, the golden child is, is going to have to take as far as understanding now where she is versus where she was in the family system. So that's, that's really, uh, it's going to take a lot of effort on her part to really understand where she is now and who she is now versus from before. Because in so many of those cases, they're, they're getting that reinforcement from outside of themselves. Uh, and this is where she needs to develop that internal system where she can generate uh, good feelings within herself. Okay, so... Um, just looking over... 
what you all are sending in. Uh, yes, it, it is true that a lot of people maintain distance from their narcissistic family, that in some cases, that's the only way that you can really survive that, that experience by having an extreme boundary that way. If you tried all different other types of boundaries, uh, for some people, they, they have to set an extreme boundary for their self-preservation. So a question is, uh, is it possible to ever trust again? And um, I believe that uh, trusting is a gift that we give ourselves. Of course, when we, when we give the gift of trust to someone else and they break it, that's incredibly hurtful. Uh, and, and that betrayal is cut so deep. Uh, but um, that's about you coming in within yourself and beginning to say, how, how can I trust myself today? What are things that I'm doing well? Uh, what do I know to be true? And I have people write out what I call grounding statements. So this might be five to 10 things that you're writing out as far as this, this is telling me who I am today. I'm a good dad, or I'm a, 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 a strong um, advocate for other people or I'm, I'm a, a good um, provider. So if you have those grounding statements, that can really help you to remind you of who you are and begin to trust yourself. So the question is, um, my narcissist lives with me now, uh, or he'd be homeless, uh, we fight every day. He can be a physical bully to me. The parts of me still love him. Uh, that sort of trauma bonded, toxic relationship is very difficult. Uh, I I feel that uh, you really are going out on a limb by uh, you know housing him. Um, I would strongly recommend working with a therapist again, re regaining a sense of yourself even while you're living in this storm. Uh, so it's about boundaries that you're having with yourself and then boundaries that you're setting with him. Yeah, and a lot of people do just stay away from their narcissistic family members because that's the only way, you, you're not gonna be able to convince them that you deserve love, trust, and respect. Uh, because they're not interested in, in giving that to you. They're interested in them feeding themselves. Uh, so unfortunately for a lot of folks, after they've tried outreach and boundary setting, the only way to do it is to have these extreme boundaries, which is just minimal contact. How do you leave a narcissistic mother who's dying of cancer? Um, I'm traumatized beyond words from her and cancer. Uh, of course, that is, is a very difficult situation. I was just talking with a friend of mine today who had a, a situation similar to that in her family. And um, again, what she had to do is she had to come to terms with her very difficult relationship with herself and uh, with herself and her mom uh, and where she had to say, this is who I am and this is who she is. So again, that definition is that discernment is going to create a sense within you of that you are you, you know, it's, it's not about getting lost in her issues or getting lost in, in her journey is saying, okay, how can I best show up for my mom, even though she's going through cancer? Um, what, what do, how do I want to leave the situation? So if mom were to die, how do I want to feel after all of that is, is done? So it's, it's checking in with yourself and seeing how you want to kind of go through that process. Hey, Bob. Um, yeah. Can we wrap it up because um, this is scheduled to end um, in a few minutes? If, yep. Um, I think I believe I said my wrap-ups already. So I, this way, 
and guys, just understand that I set up the Zoom meeting and because of my time, we have to do a hard end to this. And, I, and we apologize for it because it sounds like we're all having a good time, but we do this often. And Bob and I have a really good video coming up probably will be on YouTube maybe in two or three more weeks and we can just do this again. So you guys are awesome. Thank you, Bob. I, I really appreciate everybody watching tonight and thank you so very much for writing in your really excellent questions and observations because that, that helps us do our work better. And of course we, we are you know all about these topics. Um, and so thank you all for your hard work. Stay strong in your journey. Believe in trusting yourself, and there's emotional freedom that's waiting for you. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can contact me through my website, theartofpracticalwisdom.com, and you can also watch my channel, The Art of Practical Wisdom, on YouTube as well. And guys, you guys know who I am, and you know my YouTube channel. Website is selfloverecovery.com. You inspire me to keep not only working on myself and maintaining my focus, which always is the magic that helps me understand the people I, I, I desire to help. So we're in this together. And thank you for being a part of this community. Stay tuned. And if you would like to get more information about my treatment program, go to selfloverecovery.com or email us at help at selfloverecovery.com. You guys take care, find the time to nurture yourself and see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is you standing there with self-love, with embraced arms. All right? You guys take care. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye.